Hi, I'm Charlie Melcher, and I'm the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit. I'd like to welcome you to today's Future of Storyteller speaker series. This series and the summit itself are devoted to better understanding how technology is impacting and changing the way we tell stories in the broadest sense of the word. Through the power of Google Plus Hangouts, we bring our speakers back each week to lead a roundtable conversation in this open forum. Uh, we encourage you to share your questions uh, and participate in today's discussion. We're incredibly excited and honored to have with us today Jennifer Auker. Jennifer is the General Atlantic Professor of Marketing at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. A social psychologist, Jennifer has pioneered innovative research in topics such as money, time, and happiness. She's the co-author of the book The Dragonfly Effect and was one of our most popular speakers at the Future Storytelling Summit this past fall. Welcome, Jennifer. So nice to have you here with us. Jennifer, I think your mute button is on. Oh, yes. I'm so happy to be here. And I, uh, what I wanted to say was I have a feeling that that's the way you introduce all speakers. So, but I'll just go with it. I'll go with it. It's true in your case. <laughs> um, we're also very excited to have with us a great panel. So I'm going to let each of you sort of introduce yourselves. Um, Rochelle Parham, please say hi. Hi there, I'm Rochelle. I'm CMO at eBay, and I'm excited to be a part of this discussion today. Thank you. Welcome. And, and I just want to say Rochelle is also one of our uh, speakers from FOSS from 2012. So we're so excited, Rochelle, to have you um, back here participating today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, hi, Jody. Please, please say hi. Hi, Charlie. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Jody Leip, and I am a marketing brand executive, most recently with Pop Sugar and Shop Style. And I've had the opportunity to work on some other exciting brands like Flip Video and um, Current TV. So I am really excited to be here and join the conversation around storytelling. Thank you, Jody. Great to have you here. Um, Thank you. And welcome, Chris. Hi. Charlie, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Chris Sizemore, and I'm an executive editor at the BBC, and I specialize in digital innovation in and around education. So glad to have you here for today's conversation. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, so I thought we might start the discussion today by sharing a little clip of Jennifer's video, this, the video that we created with her for the Future of Storytelling Summit. Uh, it's just a little short piece of it, and I think it would be a great way to get the conversation going. So let's, let's take a look at that now. Once upon a time, information was scarce. So we made decisions based on the advice of experts, using them as north stars for insights. Now, thanks to the internet, we can ourselves try and find our own answers to questions that plague us and find information to make informed decisions. But instead of finding clear answers, we often find noise. We're living in a world where we have too much information. And because of that, we're even more susceptible to great story. It's what helps us decide what to believe in. Stories are important because they're meaningful. And they're meaningful because they're memorable, impactful, and they personally connect. Great. So can you guys, are we all back? Yes, OK. Uh, so, so first of all, Jennifer, thank you again for, for being part of FOSS this last year. That was a, a little piece of a great video, and I encourage everybody to, to check out the full um, video, which is on the futureofstorytelling.org website. Um, but I know that it, it deals with the power of storytelling, uh, and particularly I thought today we might talk about that in, in a context of a business setting. So uh, Jennifer, you've suggested that you think that, that storytelling can be very powerful to drive innovation. Uh, is, can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that true? And how, if so, how does that work? Yeah. So I, mean, I think one thing that you're noticing right now, and I'm so pleased to be with uh, Chris, Jody, and Rochelle, because um, I admire them all greatly for what their brands have been able to do. Um, in fact, I, I often lure Rochelle in um, to my classes and talk a lot about Pop Sugar, and certainly the BBC is uh, remarkable about this. But brands more generally are starting to really understand how to harness story. And I think there's a few reasons around for that. Um, one is I think more and more companies have started to think about their what they're creating is not just products or 
you know, um, talking about the features of those products, they're really talking about their um, user. So who's the individual who's using eBay? Who's, um, who's the female who's using pop sugar? And then the closer they get to that user, the more that they realize that that user has a set of stories and a set of goals. And one role of your brand is to facilitate that person um, you know, obtaining their dreams and obtaining their goals. And the deeper they get into uh, customer insights and really understanding their user, the more that stories come out of their marketing research, which infiltrate product development, um, a more empathic organization is often the result. Um, so I think that this idea of user stories and, and treating each customer or user um, or participant of your brand as a potential protagonist in their own story, I think is a very powerful unlock. Hmm. Um, wow. I could go on and on, but let me, I'm just curious if Chris or Jody or, or Rochelle resonate with that idea. Yeah, hi everybody, this is Jody. I mean, I can jump in. Um, prior to Pop Sugar and Shop Style, I, I um, worked on a brand called Flip Video. Hopefully, all of you are very familiar with it. Unfortunately, it's no longer here. But the power of the storytelling through video was so powerful. As a brand, we could have gone to the market and talked about product features and product pricing and how we competed or compared to others in our space in the marketplace. But instead, we said, wow, the power of storytelling through video, through that emotional connection, is where we want to the world to, where we want the world to be and to connect to and to relate to. So when we were working and thinking about our advertising campaign and really building awareness for Flip, we wanted everybody to tell us their stories. So in 10 seconds or 15 seconds or 30 seconds, we had so many of our fans or consumers submit their stories, their emotional video stories, and we wrapped those into commercials, and um, that became our campaign. So when you really tap in to the power of storytelling, everybody in one way or another is a storyteller, whether it's through photo galleries at Pop Sugar or writing stories and publishing them or through video, the story and what that is saying about you or your family or your friend is, I think, what the most powerful form of communication can be. I agree with that. So one of the, the, the concepts that we've been focused on at eBay is the notion that stories actually drive commerce. And when you think about eBay, you think about our buyers and our sellers and the nonprofits that are on and are all on our platform, and each one of them has a story. But also what's so incredible about eBay is each item has a story as well. So there are these incredible items and descriptions and all of these things that start to come to life on our platform and it's all around these incredible stories and and one of the things I like to discuss is the fact that these stories actually drive value and that value increases as the, as people start to understand and and connect with the story so the story of the incredible wedding dress that got lost in the taxi cab and uh, you find she finally found it and you wore it on her special day and decided to sell it on eBay like that is an incredible story that that has a lot of history and meaning and and actually uh, creates value and then the other part of this is is how do you think about using that through campaigns and to your point Lori the one one of the things that we've done particularly through social media is ask our community to actually tell their story so the story of you know why their mom is the best mom in the whole wide world or the story of you know their favorite thing they ever got on eBay or whatever it is and it's amazing the number of stories that come out and you know it'll, it'll be thousands of them and we'll be kind of combing through them all and and these stories actually create this kind of harmony that uh, that helps people to feel connected to to something and often it's an object that they end up buying I know, I know, Jennifer, one of the things that you've talked about is this idea that stories are a more powerful way for people to learn than, say, numerical data uh, or, or charts and graphs, uh, facts. Um, I think I'm wondering if, if you or Chris could sort of talk about that. Is What is the role of story relevant to um, more kind of analytic information? Yeah, so um, there's um, a fair amount of um, cognitive work, um, both from a neurological perspective and a cognitive processing perspective, that suggests that when we hear, you know, data or statistics, that it's encoded in a certain part of the brain, 
um, um, and, and processed and, and taken in. But one of the reasons why story, rather than just data, are remembered um, for a longer period of time and also resonate and, and have the potential to connect to people more personally uh, in a more meaningful way is because when you share a story, when the individual is in that story, they're processing that information, that narrative, in a way that activates more parts of the brain. Um, and so you're intaking that information both from more of a logical, rational perspective as well as an emotional perspective. And if the story is well told, and you personally see yourself in the story, then people start to feel connected, not just to the story, that information, thereby making it easier to remember later on and easier to stay connected to later on, but they also often connect with the storyteller or the person um, baked into the story. And that's also a real, um, a real potential um, advantage for um, the leader or the brand that's sharing that story. Yeah, I, I'll just interject. I mean, that that's, that feels uh, spot on to me. And you know, just think about y your, um, you know, your your favorite teacher in your life. Well, that person, she would have been a great storyteller. You know, and and that's the kind of thing that in in, in my uh, day job, we're trying to kind of harness that that idea. And, and you know, it's interesting what you were talking about the, the, these sort of digital native brands that 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 um, you know eBay, for instance. Uh, you know, the BBC is a little bit different. It's it's a bit of a more traditional storytelling company trying to come to grips with digital in a way, and uh, but of course it has a great lineage in that. So so it's something that we're trying to harness. But it's again that that the word emotional was what what really struck me. Storytelling is an important um, aspect in education and learning because of the because it because it taps that emotional part, and then as you say, that brings in the more um, the more analytical. Parts along along for the ride, if you will. That 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 feels how it works to me. Do you do you find yourself, Chris, doing a lot of that when you're thinking about taking the educational content or information that the BBC is so famous for and trying to translate it into digital products? Are you bringing emotion in with that storytelling? I think the I think the emphasis right now, to be perfectly frank, would be on trying. <laughs> um, you know, t t TV programs when they're good. Are going to be inherently emotional. So, um, y you know, s some of you will be familiar with, with some of the uh, nature documentaries that David Attenborough, for instance, um, would narrate over here. And perhaps there's a different voice over in the states uh, these days. But um, you know, th th they're emotional pictures of, of animals, basically. Now, how, mu how much are you literally learning from watching the TV show? Well, some. But the main thing is that you're you're opened up. We think to Learning later, so it's like a spark, as we say. And um, so, so I think I think that I think there's that that's the importance of storytelling is to open up that emotional space. Um, but we try to harness that. To be, to be honest, in digital products that we do, I would say that there, there's a challenge because digital feels less emotional, um, and part of part of the brand, part of the part of why brand's so important in digital is to start to bring some of that emotion in. And you guys talked quite eloquently about the idea of what I would think of as kind of user storytelling and that's something that I think the BBC needs to come to grips with um, because I think that that's important to, it, it, it feels natural in the 21st century and but with a company like the BBC with a brand like the BBC there's always that tension between traditional sort of top-down storytelling broadcasting as we say and the, a, a more um, social media native kind of way of storytelling so it, it's a challenge but I think it's there's a great opportunity there um, I, I just was thinking, as you touch on this idea of the user stories, um, as, as several of you have now mentioned that, I was just reading about uh, GoPro, uh, which in a way is kind of the, the next evolution from flip camera, uh, but it's, have this, it's having this incredible success right now, and it's all, all of its marketing is driven by the stories that its users tell. So they basically just channel the videos that they're users create, that is the marketing that they use, and they now think of themselves actually as being a almost like a media company, a storytelling company, because they're enabling all of their users to do these amazing, emotional, powerful, uh, experiential stories. Um, I mean, do you, do you guys think of that in terms of uh, when people are buying things, about enabling them to somehow connect their own stories to the, to the emotional experience of purchasing? Shell, Jody. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I think about all the things that we've been doing, one of them is uh, around creating story through um, how we think about collections, and so we've put an editorial voice around kind of that, the story there, but then there's the piece of it that is about the customer and the lens that the customer has, and so what we know just through some of our research is that those items that have really interesting stories actually have more value, and so uh, we encourage our, our sellers to actually build stories around them, not necessarily um, fictional stories, but stories that um, help to bring that item to life and, and create a little more meaning. And then the other side of that is is the, the part about sharing kind of how you ended up using the item and, and what you're doing with it now. And so there's the, the notion of I actually bought it on eBay, but then there's the other side of this equation, which is, and then I sold it on eBay too. And so um, there's a story all in, wrapped in that process. And so we, we really do see story as a great way to uh, help people to understand uh, the power of the item, but also uh, to understand how it all comes together in, in driving commerce. So, so does that mean to be a good brand uh, shepherd, one of your goals is to actually help your, your community be better storytellers? Yeah, we do a lot of that, and, and remember, our job is to connect the buyer and the seller and the nonprofit, and so that connection is often built on an understanding of who the other is, but also an understanding of the stories that they can create together. And so, uh, we we do try to help our community, particularly our seller community, to to understand what they need to do to actually make the item more appealing and more exciting, and and that comes through the description, it comes through the images. Uh, we spent a lot of time last year on getting better pictures and because those pictures also tell the story of the life of that item, whether it's a brand new item or whether it's a, 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 a pre-loved item. So the story actually comes to life through the picture and through the words. Right. And I think to, to reference your GoPro, I think it's, it's very similar to what we were trying to do at Flip where it's very aspirational and it's also it's if you can connect with that guy that's having and taking the GoPro with him. I mean, those spots, they're 10 seconds as well and 15 seconds as well. It's really amazing, and you're sitting there watching and saying, I can do that, or I should, I should get that, that product and bring it with me where I go to tell my story because people can't imagine what I do on the ski slopes or what I do, um, what I do underwater, however, however, whatever your lifestyle and your adventure, part of your lifestyle um, takes you. And so I think with a product, when you can better tell a story than it's, it's similar to what you were describing earlier rather than listing the facts and the data about that create a story around that product and the facts and the data will ultimately speak for itself um, and then I think on the other hand when you evoke emotion you evoke conversation so I mean most recently the Super Bowl all of those all of the, the, the most controversial or the most talked about spots of the Super Bowl are always the ones that come from uh, a specific point of view of storytelling. So Bob Dylan and Chrysler or the Coca-Cola spot, whether you're on the for or against side of those two spots, that has evoked a, you know, a nationwide, if not global, conversation around storytelling. I showed my 10-year-old son both spots. The first one, he said, that was a lot of, I'm not really sure, there was a lot of pictures, but I'm not sure what it was saying to me. And so I think it's just the way that people interpret your story where you've got to be really, you should be really clear and simple and simplified in your messaging um, so people can really relate and understand it. Once it's complicated, whether it's with data or too long of a story or whatever the complications um, may be, then you get sort of off task and, and sort of veer off into a place where you're not really, you're not, you're not connecting emotionally, you're not connecting with that consumer. So I think when you story tell, if you can be if you can be clear, simple, and really straightforward about focusing on the most important attributes of the conversation or of the topic, I think that's when the most success, uh, the successful results happen. So we, we have a question from one of our uh, viewers, from Luke. Uh, what are examples of brands that are telling their stories well and why? What, do you, what would you guys, where would you point? Um, so I, I will. I, I actually do think um, we we usually spotlight in the class um, companies as you know as clear and strong about this um, from you know Coca Cola, which really operationalizes story well from lots of different angles. 
um, you know, digital um, um, and, you know, all sorts of, you know, sort of transmedia channels uh, to, you know, companies in the fashion world like Tory Burch where you have offline, online, you have apps. Whenever you have this multi-touch approach where you're connecting with a customer in, you know, varied ways, then sure it becomes even more important. And when you do it well, um, to Jody's point, you know, the, the noise and the signal really pull itself apart. Um, so I, I would point to those types of, of companies. Certainly companies where the business model is easily articulated by every customer, like Tom's Shoes, uh, that becomes a really, um, a really you know, um, also um, good opportunity for um, customers to not only feel connected, but they really get where the money is going. And I think you're seeing with you know, other startups um, right now, customers are incre millennials are increasingly interested in knowing what is the underlying business model and what is the story about how you're uh, creating meaningful value in the world instead of just another cool thing? Right. Um, so let's talk for a minute about culture. Uh, I'm really interested in this idea of stories and how they help to transform cultures. Uh, Jennifer, I know you've, you've also done some work on this and the power of storytelling inside a company, not just outside when it's, or, or inside a an institution, it doesn't have to be a company. Uh, how, how important is story there? Um, yeah, I mean, this idea, so one thing you're also seeing among millennials in particular is they want to feel connected to something bigger. In order to do that, you need to have a team that you resonate with and you believe in and you trust. And you can't trust anyone that you don't know. And, um, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, in order to get the team operating, they need to feel like they know each other and they're inspired by each other. And story is a great vehicle by which a team can get to know each other. So, you know, we do lots of interesting exercises, even among the teams in the class. You know, one, one exercise I love doing in, in the spirit of Ernest Hemingway and Larry Smith is, you know, have everyone tell a six-word story about themselves. They share it with their team. And in that, you know, very simple one-minute exercise, the team uh, irrationally feels like they get each other a little bit more, even if they don't understand the story, but maybe they're provoked and they want to get to know each other a little bit more. And so really, story enables you know, a person and their own story to be potentially aligned um, with, with their team, and story is an enabler of connection as well. Um, there's a phrase that we use often in, in the Designing for Happiness class, which is, Everyone wants to feel that they are a valued member on a winning team, on an inspired mission. And if you unpack that simple sentence, you start to see, well, they need to be valued, so people need to know you and respect you, so that means they need to know your story. They need to feel like they're on a winning team, and so that means, you, by definition, any successful team has a coherence about them. They really get each other, they're inspired by each other, there's a contagion that happens. On an inspired mission means that they know what the larger mission is um, within the corporation, and at some level, they feel that they are personally connected to that larger mission. So that simple sentence, you want to be a valued member on a winning team on an inspired mission, is quite powerful. It's a great sentence, too. It's, it sounds yes, like I mean, I would go the as far beginning to say of an adventure. That... Sorry, go ahead, Jody. Yes, it's powerful. Sorry. No. I was just going to say that was very powerful. And I would say that when you think about corporate culture, brand culture, I don't think there's anybody inside Tom's that is not very clear on their purpose every day, um, whether they're w building a website or they're actually going on mission, uh, going you know, to distribute glasses or clothes or shoes. They know they have a purpose. I think Zappos is the same way. I would hope, and I'm assuming Rochelle would think the same, obviously, about every every employee at eBay. I think when you have a clear mission and a clear story about your brand, um, that really is critical for sure of the company to understand that there is a greater purpose for the work that they're doing and they're all contributing to it. So I think um, I think defining that mission is really is is very critical to have a cohesive culture inside a company. Chris, how's that at the BBC? Uh, is, yeah. is there a defined, clear mission? Are they with you on the 
changed or evolution to digital? I think there's a, <clears throat> you know, I, th I think to be to be honest, it's a it's a it's a mixed bag, really. So so there's a very very clear mission. Um, the BBC is one of the is it's a very privileged um, institution in the UK, as, as you'll know, in, in in that it's publicly funded, and so the mission is to inform, educate, and entertain, right? And that's a relative, you know, that's a pretty um, uh, ambitious mission. You know, that's all, but that's always been the mission. I think I think digital coming through um, questions some of the stories that have been told over the over the past century in the company. Um, because you know the TV business is going through a, a period of kind of um, oh um, you know self very self critical what's Netflix going to do to us you know all these kind of things but I think I think um, especially in the UK marketplace obviously the the, the BBC has has a very um, focused mission so there's some there's something about continuing to tell the same story. But allow it to evolve a bit, and I think to you know my theory. And again, I'm, I'm speaking partly as a, representing the BBC, but also just partly as a professional who has my own opinions, obviously. And I think there's something about those user stories, those those stories, as we would have said in the past, from the audience, and somehow figuring out a way to feel comfortable editorially um, uh, bringing those into the fold. Because I think there's there's something about telling the story of the UK together with the citizens of the UK. That that maybe that that should be the new story, or should that the story could evolve into. Um, in other words, informing, educating, and entertaining is not a top-down activity; it's a bottom-up activity. And, um, and there's there's some rumblings of that in in the company, um, in the organization. Um, but this is a transitional time, I'd have to say, to be frank. Uh -huh. Thank you for your frankness. <laughs> I I, um, I love that idea, and it's such a common one now that that the tools of creativity have been democratized and that now all of people who were formerly known as the audience, which suggests a kind of passivity, uh, are now the, the enablers who are, or are now enabled to be the storytellers, to be the creators, the contributors. Um, and it's an incredibly exciting time. Of course, it creates a little disruption for some of the old guard who were the gatekeepers in the media world. Uh, but equally, it's it's very exciting in terms of all the explosion of things that are being made and and the um, empowering of so many people to participate. Um, I'm curious, Rochelle, Jody, Jennifer, how how does this apply to the world of commerce? Uh, this this explosion of enabled creativity and, and contribute contribution from the citizens. Do you want me to jump in? Is, I, Anyone who would Michelle, like. There? <laughs> or we can choose a new question. <laughs> I am here. I, I, I mean, I, I feel like... Go ahead, no, go ahead, Jody. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, just most recently, um, and I, I just keep bringing up um, case studies, but uh, most recently we launched a campaign for Shop Style, which is an online fashion search engine. And what we did was get uh, a variety of, we, we asked our bloggers, like our fashion bloggers, to participate in our program. So we, give, we gave them a toolkit of our ad campaign, um, and we created a movement called We Shop Style. And we had, in the world of bloggers and fashion bloggers, every, all the audience wants to know what the fashion bloggers are wearing and what the next trends are and how they can get that look. So I think, to your point... Uh, um, when I was at Current or at Flip, it was sort of users and fans. And here at ShopStyle, now at ShopStyle, we just created the, the, the fashion blogger experience. And so we had over, I don't know how many, it doesn't matter, but we had a variety, of, um, hundreds of bloggers participate and show their own look. And they were able to participate in a, in a marketing campaign or a marketing to, uh, in a marketing movement to encourage their consumers and their fans to further follow them, get inspired by what they're wearing ultimately drive commerce. So I think that there are a variety of different ways that this is happening um, with brands in, in the world and in the marketplace today, but that's something that was really very real and really fun and very participatory from a, um, a blogger perspective. Others could have thought it was a little bit more it was um, tapping into our competition, but instead it was tapping into bloggers that could ultimately 
really be our evangelists. And I think that it just it got everybody really excited and um, and their movement having them all participate. We're seeing similar things. So when last October we launched a new feature on our platform called Collections, where uh, we allow anyone who's on eBay to actually create a collection um, just based on things that they're passionate about. And uh, so there's you know, we have a bunch of influencers in the social space who started to bring their collections to life. And, and those collections actually tell the story of the things that they're passionate about, whether they're passionate about the hottest trends or they're passionate about crystal or they're passionate about Art Deco lamps or whatever it might be, you actually start to see their personalities through the collections that they're creating by what they call those collections and, and even the stories that they wrap around those collections. And, and so it's been a lot of fun seeing all of these collections come to life on the platform and to see a lot of these really social influencers who then push their collections out to um, their followers on Pinterest or uh, all the folks that are following them on Twitter or or on Facebook or on some of the other uh, social sites because this is a way for them to express who they are but through items that they're actually interested in and and the other thing that's been great is it's been a way for our users to actually start to see the items in, on eBay in a different way so they see um, how someone's like, merchandising and pulling those together or they see uh, how um, those instead of it just being another item that's just out there, it's actually part of a story. And so uh, we've seen a lot of success on how collections actually help people to uh, to look at items differently. And, and it also just really brings out the personality of the person that's creating the collection. Sounds like a great program. Um, so I have a couple of questions that have come in from, from our uh, followers, if, if I might throw one or two of them to, to the group here. Uh, so Amy writes in and asks, uh, Chipotle's latest campaign blurs the line between original storytelling content and advertising. Does this creation of original content seem like a trend that other companies are moving towards? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try that one. Um, I do see more and more companies you know, thinking them, of themselves as media companies um, and, and, um, and starting to think, okay, well, what would a story look like and what is the right form to tell that story? Um, is it Vine? Is it Twitter? Where, where's the audience that we want to connect to and also um, you know, communicate with and listen from? So. Um, I think what's interesting about Chipotle is that they really extended that um, to a significant degree. But you know, BMW film started, um, gosh, I don't know, seven years ago, eight years ago. I'm not sure, but you know, there are companies that have started to think about what does an actual full-fleshed-out story look like um, for us. And there's, you know, obviously companies like Disney or um, the Ritz, where um, they're, they're investing more and more in video and um, longer form uh, stories. So I've at least anecdotally seen um, companies start to push this more, um, uh, you know, to a greater degree. Yes, I, I mean I think there's going to be a lot of it happening, frankly. Don't you? I mean, it started. By that's a trend that's just going to keep accelerating. Yeah, there's a company called Pixly that's um, so doing... So let's, let's run one more question. I think we're kind of coming towards the end of our time. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, I was just saying there's a great, there's a really interesting startup called Pixly that's grabbing um, what stories that people are saying across media, you know, across Vine, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and aggregating all of that data so that brands can start um, using the user stories on their you know websites etc and so you're going to start seeing a real disruption in I think the, the traditional advertising space because of this um, so we have time for let's say one more question and, and this is one that's come in from uh, Ian uh, and he asks uh, hold on let me just find it here where did I find that question? Here we go. Um, so the 
uh, its clear stories bring a level of authenticity which may be missing from a lot of companies. How do we invoke more authentic stories and what if it's against the company's values? And I think that's really a question about um, uh, kind of integrity in a way and, and uh, can a company have that kind of authentic storytelling if it's not walking its talk? Yeah, that's a hard one, you know, yeah. so, so the, your brand is so important to, to kind of who you are and how customers see you and, and you know, cust companies invest so much in building their brand and I don't necessarily mean dollars, I also just mean by kind of what they do and how they show up to people. And so there's always this fine line around uh, what people, uh, how people communicate your brand and what they share and what you al allow them to share and, and I think one of the things that uh, that a lot of brands are thinking about is is how do I ensure that I'm allowing customers to have a voice and and have um, and have a way to 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 speak freely about what's important to them, but that it stays true to to the brand and what the brand means and communicates. and And I think that there's this kind of humility and, and compassion and and Jennifer mentioned kind of empathy around how that all comes together. And so it's it's definitely tough. It's a tough one, particularly as social media. And you know, people in their right to to say more uh, becomes more prevalent. But it's um, it's something that big brands think about every day because we want to hear the voices of our customers, and we solicit those voices. The the difference is is that now it's just a whole lot more public. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even the the technologies like this, like a like a hangout, and the fact that you are all so authentic and willing to come and be. Uh, share your insights and be public and, and open about uh, the work that you do is a sign of, of how the technologies are transforming the way companies communicate with their with their customers or with a general audience. So uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for making yourself available and participating in today's conversation. Uh, it's been so great having you as part of the Future of Storytelling family. So. Um, Thank you, and I hope you'll join us for our weekly hangouts. Uh, we have other speakers coming back each week. Uh, and of course, visit the website, futurestorytelling.org. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, at FOST in October, um, if not many times before. So again, thank you, and really fun to hang out with everyone today. Uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Great. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Two years. Bye. <laughs>